for having me. Um, so today I'm going to try something that I've never done before. We're going to talk about how to fail. In particular, I want to talk about things that in the field of interpretability that I saw over the years that we should do or shouldn't do. And this, the name of this workshop is Emerging Challenges in Deep Learning. I guess interpretability is one of the emerging challenges in deep learning. I'm going to go one level deeper, like Inception, and talk about emerging challenges in that one of the field of emerging challenges in deep learning. And of course, as always, all these are on my opinion of my own, not representing Google in any way. So what am I talking about how to fail? So this all started when I read an article about inverted thinking a couple of months ago. What is inverted thinking? It's trying to think how to fail in order to succeed. And I'll give you an example. I find this really powerful. Let's say you're in a conversation. It's tense conversation, high stake conversation in your either professional setting or personal setting. And you have all these uh, emotions and things that you want to talk, say, say to the other person. In that case, take a step back and think about, how can I be a terrible person? What should I say so that makes me look terrible? And try to envision what they would look like, what they would feel to other people, to you. And try not to do that. I think for some people it comes naturally. <laughs> this, is, this is true. <laughs> Yes. I think that the reasons that people may not use this method is because there are thousands of ways you fail, and there are just... You might need one to prevent from your failing, though. Yeah, I mean, my point is that there are rare ways to succeed. Pro probably people try to think how they can succeed, and they sure. there are thousands of ways to fail, so they, they it's more efficient to think about the methods that you can succeed. Yeah, let's talk about that, more about that at the end of the talk, if you still disagree sure. with philosophical. Yes? So, uh, in, in the area of model checking, this is what is being done because they're trying to create counterexamples that show that the model fails and then fix this bug. Yes. So, the, the whole area of model checking is really based on trying to find failures of the, of the design. <coughs> the model. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, so it actually goes back to Carl Jacobi, perhaps in, in old times, where he always emphasized inverting the problem and he said that you can hard math problems can be clarified by re-expressing that problem in an inverting form. And that's I think what you're exactly saying in, in model checking can be easy. And people in uh, old time stoic philosophers also practice this method of premeditation of evils. So that got me thinking how I can apply this in my research. <coughs> Over the years, I saw some really encouraging trend line of research and interpretability, but I also saw a lot of concerning patterns, like things that we probably shouldn't be doing if we want to make progress. Things that we should be doing if our only goal is to publish papers, but not if we, we actually want to make progress. And I can easily think in five to 10 years, maybe there will be another Simon's workshop and we'll be uh, circling around and drinking beer and someone asks, so this field of interpretability you worked on, what progress did you make? What, 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 what did you do in the last 10 years? And I try to think in what we should, we should do so that the answer to that question is, I don't know, we didn't do anything the last 10 years. So this talk is based on this opinion article that I wrote a couple of months ago. Just like any other subfield in machine learning, interpretability is going through some hype. These are papers, a number of papers that are published in uh, interpretability on Google Scholar, just interpretability. I think Julius' slide had interpretability and neural network. Numbers are small compared to maybe mainstream deep learning, but I think it, this is exciting. But we want to make sure that we are actually making progress. So why am I keep talking about actually making progress? Because we've been here before. In 1980s, when expert systems is a hot thing, there's this subfield called EES, explainable expert systems. So people already recognize this is a problem that we want to solve, communicating complex information to humans. And lots of papers were published. Probably some people did PhD on this topic. 
And I do think that we gained a lot of insights from this line of work, but it's probably also safe to say that we didn't quite solve the problem. So we want to make sure that we are going in the right direction this time. So this talk is about my own reflections of this field, 11 items of how to fail. And think of this as opportunities for failure for success. And I realized that these observations are subject to my own subjectivity, my opinions. So to make this more concrete, I reviewed all the papers that were published in last year, ICML and EURIPS. And I'll tell you some aggregated statistics and some examples of how whether these papers fall into any of the categories <coughs> of failure that I'm going to talk about. And I also realized that I have a unique opportunity today to have theoretically minded people in the audience. So I'm going to try to propose how theory can help interpretability. These problems are yet to be well defined, but if you're interested in thinking about this problem, please let me know. We'll to clarify. And these, each item that I'm going to talk about is a talk of its own. So I, while I hope that this inspires you to think about a lot of uh, other ideas that you have to uh, try to avoid the derailing the talk, please only ask clarification questions during the talk. I'll leave time for this question later. All right, so this talk is not about pointing fingers. I will be pointing fingers at myself, things that I've done wrong, things that I wrote in my papers that I wish I didn't. But uh, I will try to block out the papers that I'm going to talk about, the names. Of course, I'm not going to show you the author names. And I will show you some figures, which you may recognize which paper it came from. So I just want you to let you know that I did like a lot of these papers. Just because you, I have this picture here doesn't mean that I don't think that this paper deserves uh, published in main venue. And I also hope that this is not just sound like me venting, working in this field. Uh, if you sense the sign of venting, that means that I care. And of course, this is the whole point of this talk is because I want the field to succeed. So it's not at all a pessimistic view of the field. And I hope that this new way of thinking would help us viewing these issues and problems from a different angle. So here's our agenda. Many, many different opportunities to fail. First, failing in motivation, setting expectations, how uh, offering what interpretability method can do and cannot do. How to fail in making an interpretability method. How to fail in evaluating one. And how to fail in giving that explanation to people and having them interpret that explanation. And how to fail finally. So let's jump right in, how to fail in motivation. How to fail number one, we need interpretability to increase user trust. I think Julius alluded this excellently earlier, but interpretability and trust are a completely different problem. You may get trust as a byproduct, but as it will become more clear, I think what interpretability methods should do is err on more helping people distrust the model. And yet 17% of papers claim some connection between interpretability and trust. And I was one of the first ones to fail. This is abstract of my PhD dissertation where I wrote, these systems also must be transparent to earn experts trust and be adopted in their workflow. And this is the only time that trust occurs in my entire thesis, but I regret this deeply and I have to live with this because I can't edit my dissertation. And what I lacked back then is what it seemed to be naive jump from transparency to trust was completely wrong. In fact, if your goal is to just gain trust, your best bet is to look at psychology literature. There's disturbingly many literature on how to manipulate people and how to manipulate the <coughs> crowd for, for political reasons like a whole another talk. And the reason that I think why interpretability methods should or err on more distrusting people is this thing called automation bias. 
What is automation bias? It is a pattern that humans have in over-trusting machines when they shouldn't. And the first empirical evidence was observed in 1993 when human engineers were in the in job of detecting when engine fails. When the engine status was on automation, they can only detect half, less than half, of the failure cases than when engine status was on manual. Another case uh, would be particular interest of people who plan to fly home after this workshop. It's this study in 1992 when they put pilots in a simulation and they presented a scenario where one of your engine is failing, you have to shut off one of the engine, and they told the pilots to shut off the wrong one. And 75% of the time, they shut off the wrong one. Now, I think that's alarming, but I think it's what's more alarming is the base rate. The base rate is 25%. Now, note that you know it's 1992, it's 2019, so hopefully things are better, but I think it's interesting showing there's a huge uh, amount of literature on human factors on automation bias. And Joshua Kroll recently wrote a beautiful paper that says, because of these many biases, just requiring explanation is not sufficient. And this paper I also talked about in my previous talk, I think Julius alluded to too. This beautiful work came out a couple months ago that showed that the deep learning model was not looking at this medical image where the information should be coming from. Instead, it was looking at what machine took this picture, the model of the machine, and other things that shouldn't matter. And they figured out this out uh, via ablation study. And given all this, I really think that interpretability methods should help people consider distrusting the model. And as a kind of a sidetrack, when you're doing user studies, I think it's very important to add this bogus option, like a random explanation, just to make sure that we're not just fooling ourselves, that you didn't gain, you shouldn't gain trust in this case, you shouldn't accomplish the task in this case, because otherwise, we don't know what explanation is helping you. How to fail number two, we need to understand every single bit of the model. We may not be able to. There are human superhuman performance network where this may not simply be possible. I view interpretability problem as like a translation problem. This is a hard one, but we are trying to translate the machine language to human language. And for those of you who speak two languages or, or three or four, you may know that there are words that you can translate. You cannot quite translate one to one, but you can kind of try to describe what it means to get the meaning across. And that's still helpful. 15% of the paper did not mention any of these uncertainties, that these are not, not everything about what model is doing. And here's our first theory question, interesting theory question, that I think it would be interesting to try to quantify how much coverage we have is this interpretation method has on the model. So if you're familiar with the software engineering, there's a unit test, and we, there's lots of different ways to define how much this test covers the entire code base. I think there's a, a, another work that tries to do a similar thing for deep learning model a couple of years ago or months ago. I think it would be interesting to try to come up with a definition of how we can uh, define the coverage for our interpretability method, how much it covers the model. What does coverage uh, tell you? I was thinking more like if the model is superhuman performance, then perhaps we can only understand 80% of the model, so I can explain, but 20% we can explain, that kind of thing. But does that mean something? Does that mean something? Yeah, what <coughs> well, I think it would be useful to, for example, say you have simil similar accuracy. One is, do you have two models? One has better coverage than others. Maybe in some cases you want to choose the better coverage model. Uh, how to fail three? Every yes. Percentages are with respect to what, right? Like the oftentimes, like when you when you say the model's not using the features you want it to use, what you're saying is you're speaking to an anticipated scenario where the distribution on which you evaluate the model is not the one on which it was trained. I think there's a lot of dif difficult questions. 
you could you could report a coverage number that really becomes meaningless in that context. I think there's a, there's a lot of difficult questions to think about and discuss about. Happy to discuss offline. I think it's an interesting question. How to fail number three. Every model must be interpretable. Uh, no, you don't need interpretable machine learning all the time. In fact, I think some things that we think we need interpretability now may become uh, in a situation where we don't need it anymore. For example, perhaps you realize that's your best option, or maybe you have enough empirical evidence that it works, that you <laughs> accepted the mistakes that it might make. Then maybe you don't need interpretability. In fact, there are a lot of things, technologies that we use currently that are not interpretable. Other cases, you may only care about performance, you don't need interoperability, and so on. So next up, how to fail in making a method. How to fail for. Uh, we first have to define a universal mathematical definition of interpretability that works for every single case, for all tasks, for all users. But before that, we have to hold off everything. I just don't think this is possible. I would like to do it. I don't think it's possible. Because if this were possible, then psychology, cognitive science, asking what would make people happy or sad would have been solved by now. What would make people satisfy and help them in any case for anybody? I just don't think this is possible. However, it is very important speed of being clear of what your definition is in your paper. What do you mean by interpretable in your paper? Mathematically or either human in the loop evaluation? Because only then your paper is useful. If I don't know what your definition of interpretability is, how am I supposed to know as a reader whether your paper is relevant to my application or not? Now, unfortunately, 40% of papers did not clearly define what they mean by interpretable. And these papers has interpretability or interpretable in their title. I think that's a, a little bit one too many. Here's my favorite example. This work said, in this work, we are interested in an orthogonal notion of interpretability. I'm not sure what that means. Do we mean orthogonal away all the interpretability and left with uninterpretability? Or does it mean maximal entanglement? I'm not sure. I failed to find this exact definition of this in this paper. An interesting theory question here is, let's think about like a simplest setting where you have a 2D data points. <coughs> and let's even assume that you have Gaussian distribution. Something like nice and simple like this. And let's decide on the task and the user. Like you're helping people to debug for people, developers in Google. In that case, can we think about what the optimal explanation would be? What would make them maximally, perhaps under a time constraint, what would help them maximally debug the model? And while this would be a made up scenario, it would be limited, I think it might help us to think forward where we're going, what, are lack, what we are lacking, or different fundamental problems. How to fail number five, the performance and interpretability trade-off is inevitable. This is not true. They could be mutually reinforced. 80%, almost 80% of papers show that there is no trade-off between the two. Here's some papers that show that DNN has similar accuracy than it was theirs. Here's another paper that showed that their interpretable method can beat uninterpretable method. And here's Cynthia's paper again on, on how to, uh, 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 on opinion piece, where she said that this trade-off is not necessarily true. <coughs> it doesn't mean that it's always false. It's not necessarily true. In fact, here are some papers that show the trade-off. Here's x-axis on accuracy, y-axis on some definition of interpretability, and they show that the trade-off exists. I think this is, I mean, I, I cannot stop myself. This is complete, I mean, so it's obvious. I mean, we don't, there's no point in discussion. If you have short explanation, you have only few possible explanations, and therefore your approximation power is smaller. Now, sure, there are things that fall under this small approximation power, but the, the trade-off between 
uh, expressibility of the model and how complex the model is is clear mathematical statement and there's no point to argue about it. I see. I think that's a good point. I think the difference between what we are talking about is the definition of what is what it is interpretable. In any definition, interpretable is a short description. Mm. So you cannot have an interpretation which is twenty thousand lines of code. But you're comparing items that do not share anything in common besides the fact that they both like the word interpretable. I mean, you report eighty percent. There, there's nothing that these methods have in common. Right. These are interesting discussions. I think I want to defer this to later. Uh, not sure what you're asking, but I get what you were saying. Let's let's talk about this because I'm interested. Oh, I'm saying in that what you think you're saying, and that you didn't actually characterize the trade-off. Like one quantity is accuracy, and the other quantity is a different thing on every single graph that you I show. Think, uh, yeah, I think we we have to talk about the paper itself to actually get into the detail. But let's let's discuss harder. So, I mean, interesting theory question though is that under different definitions of interpretability, some are simple and some are maybe non-trivial. Can we de determine what case a trade-off happens and when, in what case trade-off doesn't happen? One of any perhaps, perhaps the answer is that there is always going to be this trade-off under on any definition. Uh, that would be useful to know. Then we want to kind of figure out what these papers were discovering. It's a question about the papers, not a question about the interpretability. All right. These are definitely inspiring, interesting questions. I love it. Let's discuss this over the lunch. All right. And this is, I think, one of the most controversial thing. And, and I think it stems from uh, someone, as someone pointed out, defining things differently. And perhaps we're, we're, we're agreeing after all. So let's keep going. How to fail number six. How I present the explanations doesn't matter. <coughs> the shortcut, the fastest way of failing of any interpretability method is having a poor interface or workflow design of how users would see the information. And if you discuss with nobody with HCI expertise or cognitive scientists, you guarantee they fail. And if you talk to practitioners, this is pretty commonly agreed form. And oddly so, I think HCI expertise is uh, one of the most underappreciated field while that's by its, its importance. Like when is the last time you used an app that was just, interface was just so bad that you should be able to do this in two clicks, but instead you did like 10 clicks. And I should also emphasize that HCI is not just about interface. It's about designing the workflow, studying what users really need, and look at the entire spectrum of usage from learning the tool, using the tool, debugging the tool, and the whole thing. There's a lot of science in it. Here's some examples uh, for a good laugh. If you have time in the weekends and you want some good laugh, I highly recommend going to this link. Data is ugly in the Reddit as, uh, uh, thread. Really good. I had a hard time picking these two because there are so many good ones. So here's uh, visualization that are designed with well intention that quite didn't work out. So here we are looking at a bar graph, tech job growth in the uh, 10 to 100 cities. And uh, there's only the height of the bar matters. Uh, that rep represents how big the population tech job was. But the map is bird eye view. So you can't quite see the height of the graph. Colors would have been a good addition, but uh, it, it didn't come across. Here's another example. Uh, these are ranking of law schools over the years. And I think this means like how much fluctuated the ranking was over the years. So yeah, it makes sense, but then after 18, it's like, I'm not sure what this is going, where this is going. So next up, how to fail in evaluating the method. I think Julius's talk was a perfect setup for this. How to fail number seven. Since there is no good way to evaluate interpretability methods, I can only show you qualitative results. Now, imagine a paper, a classifier paper, that you're selling a classifier. And I never gave you the test accuracy. And I just picked a couple of data examples that looks challenging to classify. And I said, look, I can classify these data points. It's a typical IC method. <laughs> That's so sad. Uh, oh, man. But at least you would have some number for test accuracy, right? I hope. I see. 
Yes, I think that's a problem. The qualitative cherry picking good looking examples. Uh, how do I know that it generalized? How do I know that what worked for you in this one beautiful example would work for my case? 40% of the paper, I think that's too many. We're only showing qualitative examples as a result. And here are some of my uh, favorite ones. This one is picking out, this is a test data point, and picking out some positive examples that positively contributed to prediction of this, negatively contribute to this example, and they're comparing with some other baseline. And while the author says it provides, uh, their, their method provides clear positive and negative examples, I have a hard time reading this. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to read the color of the animal or similar, and that's because, and that's why it could have been confused because this animal is uh, different from that elephant animal. I'm not so sure. Here's another example. This is a question answering paper where the boxes are your explanation. So for example, if the question was what is, uh, are there any trees in this picture, then the boxes are around the trees. Okay, that makes sense? Here's another paper, uh, here's another picture with toilet and a table. I'm not sure why there's a table in the toilet, uh, in the bathroom. But in this example, is this a prison toilet? There's some boxes on the table and there's some boxes on the toilet. I'm not sure what to read from that. Is that good? Is, why not smaller box? Why not box that contains both of them? I don't know. Here are other papers that defined what good explanation is mathematically. Uh, in this paper, the alignment, which is the definition of interoperability, is a measure of how similar the input images are to explanation. Their definition of a good explanation is how similar they are to input image. So what's the problem with this is you can think about a trivial explanation method where I just give you input image right back then it's the best explanation method under this definition. Where was this published? Uh, either ICML or NeurIPS, one of them. And another paper this, that defines that we observe that this method generates accurate interpretation that better comply with clinicians' uh, intuitions. And here under this definition, good explanation is whatever your users like, whatever that makes sense to humans. While your users might be happy, your goal is to interpret the model, not the users. So what model might be doing is com might be completely different. Under this definition, I can also think about a bogus explanation method where I just give you back what you want to hear and echo what the expert says. And under this definition, that will be the best interpret interpretability method. And what is wrong with this? I think Julius' talk, talk about uh, uh, covered this pretty well when we have a saliency map with fine network, and when we randomized the weights, we ended up with very similar explanations. And if you look at this explanation, this saliency map is a type of explanation, as you heard, um, they look like the input image. They look like the input image, it highlights the bird. And they make sense to me. They have a bird inside. But is this the right explanation? We don't know. Under this sanity check experiment, I think we have reason to worry whether we are solving the right problem. Perhaps this is solving something else, but not what we are going for. And I, I cannot overemphasize that uh, just because when you see it, you like it, doesn't mean it works. It does not mean that it's showing you the truth. So I talked about how um, a, a reality that you can evaluate by making up a data set where you know the ground truth. And I'll give you an example of this. This is some work that I did with uh, Sherry Yang at Google. And what we did is pretty simple. So we gathered some scene pictures, forest, kitchen, um, bedroom, bedroom. And then we pasted a dog patch. This is the same dog, Corgi, every single picture. So the dog doesn't give you any information about classifying scenes. <coughs> so while this is part of the image, and being dog perhaps on the bed kind of makes sense to humans, the explanation method should not, or attribution method to be specific, should not highlight the dog, because we know that dog wasn't important. And while this is only testing a very subset of what attribution method should or should not detect, it's only looking at false positives, it's a good starting point. 
<coughs> I think there are many, many data sets that you can formulate such that you know this basic case, your method is doing what you expect to do. And if it doesn't, then you should stop right there and go back to the drawing board. Who says a dog should not be important? We, we did a bunch of tests. I will also tell you in, 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 in an offline session. But we haven't defined important how to, what the test sort of uh, is uh, putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, we did a pretty rigorous testing to make sure that dog, when it's removed, it doesn't affect the scene. We do KL divergence test and then so on. So we, we propose a couple of metrics that are complementary to each other and we open source model data and uh, the metrics. And we show some uh, the popular methods and how they do under this metric. And remember, this is not perfect. This is still a low bar test. It's a semi-natural data set, but it's a starting point. This is something that you can do. You can formulate your own and your own domain and, and test it. Yes? Uh, sorry, could you explain like how this context applies to interpretability? So if, just illustrate, like, if the neural net gets thrown off by the presence of the dog, it's like what? Uh, sorry, I, I, perhaps I should have spent a little more time here. So uh, this is uh, referring to a particular type of interpretability method called the attribution methods, which is what Julius talked about. And the goal of that method, common goal of that method is identify a pixel or a feature such that when I remove it, then the classification goes off the rack. So the goal is of these interpretability methods is identify where in the picture or your input data set that important information lies. And this is just a data set that where you can do initial evaluation whether your, your method is working. So that feature would, would be the predictor for the outcome. Uh, yes, so the goal of attribution method is predicting the features that would be predictable, uh, predictive for the class, but this is actually uh, testing the inverse. Right. Yes. So which is why it's just testing false positives. Okay. So the dog should not be important. It's not that dog should be important or kitchen should be important. We're just testing that dog should not be important. Also, yes. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Let's keep going. How to fail number eight. I am a computer scientist. Running human experiments is outside of the scope of this paper. Remember the whole point of what we are doing is for cons human consumption. If there are no humans, I won't be doing what I'm doing. So if you don't check with your final customer, then you, have, you might be creating something that is completely irrelevant. This is one of my favorite cartoons. I think it comes from software engineering uh, context where a customer really wanted something like this, but depending on who you're talking to, you can build something overbuild it, underbuild it. And unfortunately, 60% of the papers did not run any human experiments. Half of the paper did not even report any qualitative observations by human subjects or the end users. Is that too broad? Mm -hmm. You apply that argument broadly, you could say, if, if there were no humans, uh, we would not do any machine learning research. Okay, we're going to have only clarif clarification questions only, and let's, let's, let's talk about that after. I think we'll, I'll have some uh, time left afterwards. All right, so uh, moving on, how to fail in interpreting a method. Uh, how to fail number nine. The explanation is always true. It is what the model thinks. Some interpretability method, if not uh, most of them, are approximate. And like the local explanation that Julia has talked about, fitting some linear function. And depending on how you approximate, they will give you different answers, and some will be wrong. So it's really important to communicate this to users. So as a theorist, you probably think, of course it's approximate, that's obvious. But you know, for lay users who doesn't really know machine learning or do machine learning every day, they're in this uh, machine learning magic hype. They like machine learning and they think it might be magic. And it's really important to clearly communicate to them that these explanation or model predictions for that matter too, has uncertainty. 42% of paper did not explicitly mention that this is the case. 15% of papers took the interpretability, result of an A interpretability method as a ground truth and build their argument on top of it. Only one paper uh, had explicitly had, I don't know option, and what this is, is, is I can't give you the explanation, sorry. 
And I really, I think this is very important. And looking back, only one of my work, TCAV, has this option. All the other work didn't have this option. This is something we should think about. An interesting theory question is whether we can quantify the goodness of fit of an interpretability method. What do I mean? Well, it's on a proxy. So can we figure out and have some good definition of how well this approximation is? And not some maybe mathematical setting, but something that more correlates with how humans would perceive that information. And I think this can go hand in hand with the coverage question that I talked about. Perhaps you can have a good approximation but poor coverage, but maybe you can have a good coverage but poor approximation. Maybe there's some trade-off. How to fail number 10. Humans are wise and logical. I have a bad news for you. You're not. And uh, I, one of, there's lots of studies, and I, I really like a lot of them. Um, but I want to play this game here. And uh, this might be an unusually theoretically minded uh, audience to play this game, but I'm going to give it a try. So, and if you know what, this, what I'm about to do, that just don't answer it, OK? So I'm going to give you three numbers. And there's a rule that complies to these three numbers. You can ask me in, in return as three numbers. You can give me three numbers, and I'll tell you whether that number uh, uh, complies with this rule or not. Does that make sense? No, OK. So I'll give you three numbers. I give you two, four, six. Right. There's a rule that these numbers comply. Right. And you're going to guess what the rule is. There are a thousand rules that these numbers comply. <laughs> What? Uh, there's a, yes, yes, but let's, 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 uh, you're going to ask me questions to narrow down what their rule is. So, two for six. Give me numbers that, that you think that comply this rule. Be shy. 8, 10, 12. Hmm? 8, 10, 12. Mm -hmm. Yes. Complies. 1, 5, 3. Nope. Yes. All right. So this this experiment, uh, we, we had too many theoretically minded people. So <laughs> typically, the normal people, what they ask is, when I give you four, five, six, two, two, four, six, it's a such an even, a beautiful even number, right? So what they often give is in return only the even number in increasing order. So four, six, ten, twelve, sixteen, eighteen, and so on. And what this study shows, and this has been proven in large audience, is that humans are inclined to confirm their hypothesis much more than they want to falsify their hypothesis. We had two smart audience who immediately figured out, give me the counterexample. And this confirmation bias, although don't, don't think that you're not, not vulnerable to this bias, I think you are, uh, is something that I see over and over again in my studies. So here, these, uh, the subjects are doing a task where they just don't know how to complete the task. So random, uh, random guess is 50%, and subjects were doing 52% well. So this is basically a random guess. And they're looking at the same exact set of pictures. One said A is right. The other half said uh, B is right. And when they reached that conclusion based on this exact same picture, they were super confident. 40% of them were as confident as they will ever be. Looking at same pictures, they reached completely different uh, conclusions. And they were the reason of, of this is that they were looking for, when they're looking at these pictures, they're looking for reasons why they were right, the evidence that confirms their hypothesis rather than falsifies it. So how to fail finally? And I'll have a plenty of time for discussions. How to fail 11. I'm just a researcher who provide technical tools. The real world usage is something I cannot control. And here's a cute picture of a cat to alleviate the depressing story that I'm about to share with you. So going day by day, uh, writing papers, writing grants, teaching classes, it might be a lot to think about the final consequences of the tools that you're creating. 
in fact, uh, or am I responsible for what my tool is going to do in the world? A lot of research scientists and, and engineers had this asked questions, same questions to themselves in the history. Famously, uh, the inventor of AK-47, it's an automatic rifle, spent his rest of his life in deep pain that he might be responsible for lives that were claimed by his invention. Scientists who were involved in developing atomic bomb expressed their regrets after seeing the devastation in Hiroshima. The tool interpretability, one of the goal is to help experts making better decisions in high stake domains. And what that means is these tools might be used in the front line with domain experts. And I don't think it's too much to say that the goal, the function of this tool is less significant than that of doctors. While nothing can guarantee us from failing to foresee all the ways our tools can be used, let's give it a really good thought on how we might fail. Envision how you might fail in 10 years, 20 years from now. And let's try to avoid that failure as best as we humanly can. Thank you. We started late, so we have, I will say, like six, five, six minutes for questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, so regarding this question of uh, making something quantifiable out of an interpretability type of, you know, metric, suppose you manage to somehow do that, then I can see either two situations happen. So you either incorporate that into your training objective, mm -hmm. right, and then you will turn into this meta interpretability question, you know, what's the interpretability metric for that? Uh -huh. So either you keep doing this forever and at some point you saturate and you're happy, right? Or maybe interpretability is inherently some kind of an undecidable problem. Mm -hmm. Which one would it be, is your question? That's an interesting question. I, I want to th draw maybe an analogy to maybe classification, right? So we have classific, we've been building, uh, started with the simple loss function. And now we're doing like meta learning. We're doing auto ML. We're going like meta and meta. Right? It seems to be helpful, but it also is raising a lot of questions, right? I wouldn't be surprised if what you, the scenario that you're plotting about interpretability, over interpretability, that kind of thing definitely happens. But I, I actually personally think it's the latter. I think it would be something that, you know, neuroscience, I, I love the field, uh, but, but it's a really difficult question. Like we, we really struggle to understand how we reason, how humans work. I think we have very little understanding of that. And what that means is that defining what makes sense or help you the most in certain tasks is just going to be very hard to define. Yes? Just one comment here. I think that it's a too um, much of an umbrella topic. I mean, there are different applications, different uses, and maybe for each of them we should come up with a different more concrete definition. Mm -hmm. And putting everything under one title is, is really confusing the field. Oh, I see. I think that's a, that's a good point. Because I think, in a way, uh, categorizing failure modes, different failure modes, this model fails in that way, this model <coughs> fails in the other way, that's kind of helping you to use the tool safely too. So that in a way, like maybe robustness is also interoperability. Yeah, good point. Yes? Yeah, I mean, kind of on the same thread, like, what it, how would you define interpretation? Like right now in 10 minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, since it was the topic, the topic. I think what I would go for is, and there is a reason why, oh, Julius is gone. Julius was talking about different definitions of interpretability. Because just like what you said, it depends on the task and the user. And as, as his question goes, I don't think it's uh, mathematically definable. I can give you some fuzzy words with, that has give you fuzzy feelings that are kind of abstract and high level, but I don't know how useful that would be. And same thing goes for like definition of terminology in my view, is like interpretability and explainability. They're different, should we define? Um, maybe, but as long as you define it well in your paper, what you mean by explainability or interpretability, I'm not too picky about, um, Perhaps it introduces some chaos in the field, but I'm not too picky about that in a way. Consensus would be nice, but I don't think it's super necessary.
Okay, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.